Here's your host, Alex Garrett. Hey, everybody. I'm Alex Garrett. And of course, we always strive to have one leg up. And I have uh, David Sinkinson, who is part of the Sinkinson brothers, um, that got pitched to me to talk about their own startup story. David, thanks for joining me. Yeah. Hey, I'm super happy to be here, Alex. Really appreciate it. Uh, you are a, uh, your company, I believe, is Startup Different. And I want to start there. Tell us your mm-hmm. journey. Yeah, for sure. So uh, yeah, Startup Different is what we're doing now, but I'm definitely happy to talk a lot about AppArmor and kind of the experience that I had. So basically what happened was uh, I co-founded a business with my brother. Uh, my brother's name is Chris, and we actually started it and he's uh, 10 years older than me. So it's always kind of like an interesting sort of like age gap there. But uh, it turns out we actually worked you know, really well together. And our business was in kind of this interesting niche space. Uh, so we we actually worked in the area of like public safety and particularly at uh, universities and colleges across uh, Canada and the United States. And what we did was we made these mobile apps that were branded to the school. So if you went to like, uh, you know, University of Chicago is like U Chicago safe. If you went to NYU, it was safe NYU. If you went to UCLA, it was Bruin safe, like whatever. And these apps were basically a bunch of different tools that helped both uh, keep people safe, both preactively and uh, proactively and reactively. So that is, um, it was kind of this all in sort of safety suite. And, and it actually started because I was uh, working at my alma mater and, you know, sort of in the right place at the right time. I was sitting across from the uh, uh, Associate Dean of Student Affairs, and we had done this big audit of those blue light emergency polls that you see uh, on a lot of university and college campuses. And it turned out that, you know, a significant percentage of, percentage of them were broken. And so I was kind of like, hey, well, you know, what if we had an app where you could press a button and you could call uh, your campus security at that institution and they could see your position in real time? And th- this was back in like 2012. So like the App Store was like a year or two old back then. So you know, I, I'm putting it in context, like BlackBerry was still a thing. <laughs> so we were kind of, that. that's where the idea came from. And then we started working with different schools and yeah, it really took off. Well, it, it certainly did so much. So it, all right. So you then sold it for tens of millions, but let me ask you about the first million, if you will, sure. that you made with App Armor. Did you expect it to be that uh, affluential? I don't know how to say the word that uh, lucrative, I guess is the word I'm looking for. Yeah, you know, definitely not. <laughs> so it's it's a very niche idea, right? And uh, so a couple of different things are going on. So first off was um, at, at in, the, in our really early days, uh, my brother and I actually had a couple of different ideas on the go, different products out there that did different stuff. Most of them were mobile app focused because it was kind of like a mobile app craze back then. And, uh, and we were generating a little bit of revenue from each one and App Armor was one of those as well. And then we kind of got down to this point where it was app armor and another one. And they were kind of, it was kind of a two horse race. Um, and we decided to go all in on app armor because, uh, we aligned more with the mission. We thought it was, you know, uh, obviously it made a lot of sense to us. We were helping people, you know, be safer. And in some cases playing a direct role in, in saving someone's life. Um, and we were also just, uh, seeing a lot of market traction. You know, people were talking about us. People were very positive about us in our sort of the, the schools would buy from us. So the schools, when they would talk to each other, were very, very positive about the experience they had with us. And I can remember actually when we did hit our first uh, million in annual recurring revenue, and it was this kind of like uh, sort of surreal moment. I remember uh, we were in a co-working space. There was a bunch of other companies around, you know, with a handful of people. Uh, but at that point, we had about five, six people. And uh, they would do this uh, social hour where they'd have uh, some beers for free in the co-working space. So naturally, like, every company was there. And, uh, you know, we would just be chit-chatting. And I remember I was talking to the owner of the entire co-working space. And they said, well, uh, they, they, she, and she said to me, I'll never catch, she said, uh, you know, the, the first million is always the hardest. And I actually think uh, that's a good take. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was a slog to get there. It was really, really difficult. It was incredibly satisfying to get there. But it was uh, a lot of work and and also kind of surreal at the same time. I couldn't believe that this kind of niche product we made and this kind of smaller market in public safety uh, was actually generating that kind of money. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, campus safety is so important. Mm -hmm. I hate to say because of all the shootings that have been going on. So how are you guys able to break into that space? And, you know, let's just be honest here. I love the public safety folks at my alma mater, Queens College. 
but public safety doesn't have all the tools. And I feel like that's why you got inspired to do this, right? Yeah, I think, I mean, kind of like we said, our, our mission was to help make people safer. That was like our, our overarching thing that we were trying to do. And the way we felt we could do that was trying to help those campus security and, and campus police groups. It's interesting. I actually went to a school called Queens University, which is actually a Canadian school uh, in the Great White North. But it's just kind of funny you said Queens College because it's like so close. But anyway, um, and, and, you know, what we learned actually when I was working uh, and on that committee was that the reason why those security groups exist, even though they're not as uh, in some cases, they're not armed. And in some cases, they're just kind of like an auxiliary force. The reason why they're helpful is that their response time to something on campus is materially faster than municipal police generally is. It's usually like five minutes faster, which in the event of an emergency is a life-saving amount of time. And so trying to equip those teams uh, and make them more efficient, make them more effective, sort of answer some of the first questions that a dispatcher uh, at a school would have, which is, you know, where are you? <laughs> uh, that really seemed to be something that on its just on its face provided a lot of value and then we also had these other tools in the app as well that were about you know you could send your location in real time to a friend as you're walking home at night we called that friend walk we had a, a safety check-in system that would call you every once in a while and if you didn't answer it would actually page the campus police or campus security and say hey this person might be in danger like there's a bunch of tools that we continue to innovate on to improve the space to make the lives better for the people who were responding to these issues uh, but at the same time, uh, also help play a role in, again, saving the lives of some people on campus. All right. Let's. And by the way, that is so important. And I, does that ever get into the high school space as well? Because obviously high schools do the lockdown drills now. Mm -hmm. I mean, can you imagine we're in this era where every kid has to go through it? We, You and I never really had to deal with it. Only we had to do was fire drills back in the day, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah. it's just incredible that we have to deal with that. And kids have to kind of be traumatized even from the drills. So did you guys expand into the high school space as well? Yeah, you know what's interesting is we uh, we actually had better success in other markets, and I'll get to that in just a second. But we did try to expand into high schools. But uh, for one thing, it's a very complicated space. So on the one hand, there's a lot of companies, and some of them are really, really big, that are in that space. And sometimes big companies, if they're in a big market and they're pretty established, they're really hard to uproot. We did have some success. Uh, we actually worked with some private schools, but we found, and this is kind of the rub here, is that depending on the school district, the amount of budget available for this sort of thing was really, really different. And to be honest, our stuff was not crazy expensive. But when you consider all the different priorities of a school district, you know, they need education or excuse me, they need software for just the grades or sending out report cards or attendance or whatever. It's, it falls down the list pretty quickly. And so it was actually pretty hard to get into that space where we had. And I imagine the privacy thing of the kids is also a big yeah. deal. Down in that part. And there are some schools who uh, that actually ban smartphones. Right. So, and that's primarily like primarily like the way that we would be like one of the powerful uh, features of the app was you could receive mass notifications in one to five seconds in the event of an emergency. So, they could just blanket everybody with a message really, really quickly. But uh, yeah, if you don't have your phone, it's not going to work, right? So it, there are some complications there. And you're right, too. The privacy rules for, uh, for minors is really, really different as opposed to somebody at a university or college. All right. Let's talk about technique, about getting this startup going. You guys say you forewent all the usual rules. Now, you know, I, I'm, an, I, I'm a podcaster. I feel like there's a small business type of yep. launch, right? This podcast. Definitely. But I just kind of did it. Are there rules to do it? I, I, I never knew of rules. <laughs> you didn't read the book? Uh, I, we have a podcast too. So I definitely know it is. It is absolutely business. It's a, and it's a tough one too. Very busy market. But um, so there are kind of a lot of like what I would probably say expectations. And in our in our upcoming books, uh, start a different, uh, the myth busting blueprint for your multi-million dollar business. Uh, we talk about actually 33 different myths that we bust and they, they range pretty significantly from, uh, you know, on the low end, it's like, you know, uh, uh, multi-billion dollar companies just sort of show up one day. And the, the reality is that's a lot of hard work that took people a long time to get there. It's usually a huge journey and quite the process, but sometimes it just feels that way. You know, social media just sort of like showed up one day, kind of felt like. So, you know, things like that, uh, th that's a really obvious example. Another one is like, you know, you don't need funding to be successful. And I actually for podcasters, this is kind of an interesting thing because, um, you don't need funding in any in any respect. Really, what you need is a microphone and something interesting to say, and maybe a decent camera, and you're on your way, right? But um, in software, there's definitely, and in, in some other businesses, there's this really strong 
allure to go and get funding for your business. But to be honest, it usually uh, puts your business further behind. And, it's, and we actually have some stats on this in the book, but it, basically 75% of all venture backed startups fail. So it, it's not as if uh, it's like this incredible silver bullet that's going to guarantee you success. In some cases, it actually puts you behind. And that's just one of a couple of examples. But for us, when we were building up our business, um, we, and you know, and I'm sure you think about this a lot too, Alex, is you, you come up with good ideas like all the time and you want to try them out and talk you about, all... you know, reinvention, right? Every time yeah. it's about reinventing. And I feel like since you've sold App Armor, you've looked to reinvent yourself through this new venture, right? Yeah. I think, you know, what we're really trying to do is I, I really think we're trying to pay it forward. I think what, what I want to get them, I get the most satisfaction out of now is helping people and going out there and saying like, look, here is, and it's not just like, look at me. I'm so awesome. I, I, I pulled off this thing. It's really not that it's very much like, here's a bunch of stuff we did wrong <laughs> and we blew it a bunch of times. And that had really significant consequences for us. Yeah. We had some cases where it went well, but in any case, we're trying to put these lessons out there to basically like help myself and, and my co-founder as if it were like 10 years before, you know, what could I have, what could I have taught myself? 10 years ago, that would have made it a better process and made me more likely to be successful or even possibly more successful than I am now. And I feel like you, you probably, you have to be delving into like rules for reaching out to people to invest in your startup and then to actually buy, you know, buy the product. Mm -hmm. uh, there's gotta be rules for everything. So let's start with, you know, getting people to invest. I know for startups and for entrepreneurs, the investment side is such a huge role. So how did you guys get people to invest in your, your product here. So interestingly, we were actually totally bootstrapped, which means we had no investors, but, uh, as we went through the process, we kind of realized like why we wanted to take that route. And one was definitely about control and about being able to control our own business and that kind of thing in the direction of the business and also not be tied to promises. We made an investor that it, you know, and the investor has fundamentally different interests. They are looking for a, basically a payout after about, you know, three to five years. And so uh, for us, it was just a different path. Now, some, I will say though, for what it's worth, and I don't want to be like Mr. I hate venture capital because I actually think investing is very important for some businesses. And there's two scenarios for that. Like one is if you're like a really capital intensive business. So you make a product, you ship it, it's in a warehouse, um, what have you. Uh, one of my favorite books is uh, the book uh, by Barry Nailbuff and uh, and his uh, co-founder, Seth. And they have this book called uh, Mission in a Bottle. And it's all about the Honest Tea brand, which I don't know if you remember, but it was like a tea brand in the kind of the early 2010s. And they had such expenses, like they needed money to do it. You can't, you can't start a big consumer brand without it. Um, and then the other circumstance where you might want funding is later on in your business's life. Like it could be once you reach, you know, like 10 million of ARR, uh, annual recurring revenue, that you might want to get funding. That might be a time to think about it. But really, our big thing was in avoiding investors early till we understood and had credibility in our market. Uh, I always ask, speaking of venture capitals, I always ask uh, people who have done these startups and who are entrepreneurs and CEOs of these, you know, not your usual corporate culture companies, I guess to say is yeah. were you in the corporate corporate world and you just decided I'm going to do my own thing. And your brother said the same thing. Yeah, definitely. So I was in, uh, I worked for a huge what, a mega telecom firm <laughs> who shall remain nameless. And I, um, yeah, you know, I, I found that I was just like really far away from the customer and far away from doing anything meaningful. Um, I did go to business school, so I do kind of get the corporate spiel on that side of the equation. Um, I, I think for me, it just felt, it felt way more satisfying to be closer and more in the business and closer to the customer and listening to people and making a real impact. Whereas, uh, you know, the corporate culture is a little bit different sometimes and not to say all corporate cor cultures are bad either. It was just, wasn't really for me, uh, uh not at, at all. <laughs> so being a myth buster in, in this space, I think of the show Mythbusters. Were you inspired by them? What they do? I have to ask. <laughs> yeah, I like that show actually quite a bit. Uh, they're so cool. Uh, yeah, you know, I think maybe sometimes. I, I think, oh, again, like the reason why we want to bust myths isn't just because it's like busting myths. Like why do they bust myths on Mythbuster? Because they don't want falsehoods to proceed, to, to go, get out there. And I think that's really what it's about for me too is that when you're a founder, you're going to be confronted with tons of decisions and they can push you to make different kinds of 
uh, that can push you socially to be in weird situations where you make decisions that aren't always in your best interest for your business. So, you know, you think, well, I, somebody said, I remember like we had this happen where somebody said to us, oh, uh, you don't have funding. So you're not really a startup, which was like crazy. Cause we were obviously, a startup. <laughs> but you know, that's when you get this weird, like, oh man, should I be doing this? Am I doing this wrong? Like there's a credibility crisis piece that I think happens for a lot of founders. And I really, I think the reason why we're busting these myths is to tell people it's okay. You don't need to do this. Your method of doing this is entirely valid and legit. So keep going, keep pushing, and you can be successful. It's 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 not gentle parenting in the sense, but it's gentle sort of like you're you're being a little more softer and, and understanding than maybe the average person. And you know, I think as someone who started up this podcast 15 years ago, believe it or not, yeah, wow. on college radio. Yeah. Um, I've been going hard for 15 years, but you're kind of teaching me slow down a little bit. Just enjoy the process, right? Yeah, you know, we uh, we I've had the benefit of speaking to some uh, pretty interesting people. Actually, I met this uh, one guy. He's the co-founder of a company called Applyboard. It's worth four billion dollars. It's like amazing. And uh, but he founded it with his two other brothers. So he's trying to one up my brother and I. But anyway, uh, and and actually, one of his brothers is a twin too. But one of the things he said that was really interesting to me was he, uh, you know. It's a, enjoy the journey. Like as you go through this, like that's the fun and kind of being on the other side of this now, looking back, I miss those times. I miss the time I got to spend with my people. I miss the time I got to spend, you know, in the business with customers, working on problems, you know, feeling uh, super productive every day. You know, uh, that's uh, that's a tough feeling to lose. And uh, I do think that focusing on the journey for anybody who's listening today, whatever you're doing, whatever you're pushing for, focus on the journey, because a lot of the time that is most of the fun. Absolutely. I mean, we're 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 going strong now. You're in Canada. You're just mentioning. So yep. talk about the geographical differences um, between starting up there versus here. The econ economics are very different in both, you know, Canada and the U.S., aren't they? Yeah. Totally. So I mean, like, just getting it straight, like the United States is the market of first resort. So every business kind of wants to be there. It's a humongous market for almost anything you want to do. Uh, and we were no exception. I, I, what was interesting for us is that we had a good client base. We had about 25 to 50 clients in Canada in our early days. And uh, we had a hell of a time, though, getting into the US. And we knew we needed to get into the US to be successful. Um, and, so, uh, and so a couple of thoughts there. One is that for Canadian businesses, we kind of like, we can go down and we can look and watch the United States and we'd be like, Hey, what's happening? What are our competitors doing down there without being like actively in the market? And then we can decide when we want to enter. So kind of like, interestingly, not that many American companies come up here very quickly. They, they tend to come a lot later in their life. So it gives, I, I joke that we're kind of like a business incubator for the United States. We come up with these ideas, we do stuff, and then we go into the U S and we compete. And uh, so then later on, when we did enter the market, we were in a weird situation where uh, we didn't have any referenceable clients in the US. And so we actually did something we called, we, we bought a customer. So this is kind of an interesting thing, but basically we just gave the University of Florida, the Florida Gators, like the best deal ever because we needed that Gator. We needed a nationally recognizable brand that we could then take to basically every single national school. champion quite a few times. You yeah. Know? Right. Hell, I obviously one of my favorite schools. <laughs> so, well, interestingly is FSU joined like really closely after. So I have the, you know, I, the, I have a flag in my house, you know, the house divided and you've got the sure. Gator and the Seminole and anyway, it's pretty fun, but yeah. So, um, but anyway, doing that was, a, it was actually very challenging, but once we had gotten into the U S market established a little bit of credibility, we were off to the races. Oh yeah. Well, you know, Credibility is key. Now, when I think of the word bootstrap, I have to think of cash strap as well. So mm -hmm. did, for those who want to do what you're doing and are afraid that they're going to be cash strapped and bootstrapped at the same time, what's your message? Yeah, it's short-term pain for long-term gain. So it's it definitely sucks for a little while. Uh, your standard of living is going to be basically the same, potentially worse if you had a more cushy job somewhere before that and you made the leap to to doing that, but the, uh, but it's worth it is what I would say, because you do get such an amount of control and you're the master of your own destiny. You can decide where this business is going. It's not that you don't listen to other people like mentors or other folks who are going to give you quality feedback and good market insight, but you're just not beholden to an investor or somebody else who's frankly just going to be misaligned to you. Like they're going to be looking for a different kind of return. You know, one of the big things that 
those businesses do is, uh, or excuse me, those investors do is they have this like get big fast strategy, which is another myth with that we bust where, you know, they want you to get as big as, as quickly as possible. And their idea is like, if we put money into your business, that's going to happen because then you can hire a bunch of people you can do a bunch of things. And the reality is that just some markets aren't ready for that. So if you do that and you get $2 million of funding and then you blow it over a couple of years and, and you hired a bunch of salespeople and you're just not getting any results because the market isn't educated well enough yet. It's not there yet. Like if we had gotten money in our early days, we would have had this problem for sure. The market wasn't there yet. And uh, I think it, paradoxically, it can actually be a really net negative thing for your business. It would have definitely tanked us if we had gotten investing, invested investment in the early days. You just mentioned something very interesting in, in like different markets, right? So let's talk about the rural schools because a lot of colleges are highlighted, you know, the big 10s, the big yeah. 12s, but, but there are a lot of rural colleges. You guys tap into that market as well. Oh, absolutely. Um, so uh, putting this all in context, I remember I, I already said the, the United States is a market of first resort. So Canada has 150 higher education institutions. The United States has over 7,000. So you truly, you got to be in there. Uh, and you've got to be able to cater to schools of all different kinds of shapes, sizes, and places, you know, everything from your two-year community college to your, you know, elite, you know, Ivy league private colleges. And, uh, yeah. So our product was interesting because we weren't like one mobile app. Like I mentioned earlier, we were, we were branded each school. So we actually did a good job of making this like assembly line of mobile apps effectively. And when we went to market to these smaller rural colleges, we kind of had an idea based on other ones that we worked with, like what features would work for them and what weren't, what wouldn't. And we would tailor the app to their needs. So kind of, uh, you know, I don't want to say it's like mass customization. It kind of is though. <laughs> it is like we had this tool, we would put their logo on it. We could change the buttons and all that stuff in real time using a content management system. And so that whatever that school was focused on, whatever its needs were, they could change the app. We could do it with them. But at the end of the day, they were going to have something that worked really well for their particular institution. All right. Let's get to the toughest part of all this, which is you sell your baby. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's your baby. That's you and your brother's baby. Um, that had to be a difficult decision at first, or what was the decision process like? Yeah, it's actually kind of interesting. Uh, I've been on some other shows and this is uh, obviously a common question. And the funny thing is we actually, the company that ended up buying us, they're called Rave Mobile Safety, and they had a big investment firm behind them called TCV. And they actually approached us a year before we ended up selling and they made us an offer. Uh, and the offer was worth $20 million. And so, you know, it's not every day that somebody offers you that kind of money, but it had a lot of strings attached. It had a lot of things that we weren't comfortable with, uh, a long earnout period, big sales targets we had to hit and all these kinds of things. And so we actually passed on it. I mean, which was kind of crazy. It felt really, really weird. And so we we said, hey, come back to us in a year. Uh, we do want to do this, but we're just, we think we can do better. So we bet on ourselves. We went back into the market. We had a banner year. Um, we boosted our numbers and they ended up doubling the offer to $40 million. And so that was when, okay, it was like, okay, we're definitely doing this. Like that was kind of like the, the offer you can't refuse kind of thing. And uh, it, so on the one hand, it's super jubilant and I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of due diligence and how difficult it was to actually like go through the process of selling the business lawyers and accountants galore. But, sure. Yeah. But I think that, you know, on the one hand it was really jubilant because it was this amazing thing that happened. But then on the other hand, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's sad. It's, it's legitimate identity loss, you know? Now, you know, you say 10 million, but then both companies get sold to Motorola for $550 million. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to ask, did you guys get a cut of that at least? I mean, what was that like? Yeah. So, uh, in the negotiation, when, uh, Rave Mobile Safety, uh, purchased us for, uh, $40 million, uh, during that negotiation, uh, we were also talking to the folks of their investment group at TCV. And I sort of said, Hey, I'm betting you're going to spin this thing around like, and, and sell it in like a year or two. And they were like, yes. <laughs> so I was like, okay. I was like, well, if we're going to do this, then we want a little cut of that as well. Now it's nothing. Not we didn't get another forty million dollars. I'll tell you that much. Um, and, but we did definitely uh, participate in that in that process. Uh, we were part of the due diligence and sort of like the convincing of Motorola Solutions that it was you know a good idea, all that kind of stuff. Sure. And uh, yeah, so we definitely participated. Talk about making sure you're selling your company that you started into good hands. That matters a lot, doesn't it? Yeah, for sure. I think. 
So that the the million dollar question, like literally, is you know what is your business worth? And it's uh, there's there's two, and I'll get to the other intangibles in a second. But so the what is your business worth question is super difficult because on the one hand you don't know when a global pandemic is going to happen, right? That came out of nowhere, and then you on the other hand you don't know when like uh, this is the analogy I like to use, but. Uh, when like Taylor Swift's gonna like <laughs> you wear a T-shirt that's got your company logo on it, right? Like you just, it's hard to predict the future in any capacity. So what you have to do is you have to find a number that you're happy with. And for us, that that was a big number and it locked in sort of like the generational wealth that we were sort of looking for. Now, the other part of this though too is what are they gonna do with you, your people, your technology and your customers? So for us, I wanted to make sure that, you know, we were obviously part of the transition, but I didn't want to be there forever. I wanted to make sure that none of our people were getting like fired or let go or whole departments, you know, got you know, just, just. Right. Taken out. And then also the value system didn't change when you sold them over. Right. Yeah, exactly. Like the thing is they're purchasing as much as they're purchasing, like our financials and, you know, our revenue, all this stuff. They're also purchasing like our culture and our, and our processes and our systems and it was very important to me that they understood that. And so that those were our three other pillars that we tried to focus on, which was our, our people, our technology, uh, and our customers. I also didn't want our customers to suddenly have their prices you know, doubled or tripled on them or just generally not be taken care of. So I tried to make that super clear to them. And they've been amazing, to be honest, uh, from, by all accounts. Of course, I don't work, don't work there anymore. But No, uh, but did you bring them over into sort of like your startup different? business now are they part of your world now there uh no it's totally separate i mean startup different is like you know we're paying it forward to founders and other people okay. but I, a lot of the you know our, have people have one leg up in other words right yeah exactly a hundred percent that's actually why i want to come on the show because i was like yeah this this guy's gonna get it for sure but like um you know i, I think again we're just trying to pay it forward and help people do better than us and um yeah, and I, I, I hope that with you know people we have on our podcast and our book that's coming out and all that good kind of stuff that we're doing that that we're actually delivering that value for people. Well, I, maybe I'll be able to talk about this, but I'd love to maybe go through each myth after the book's released, give them give give readers more of an insight through this podcast. If you'd like to do that, that'd be awesome. Sure, yeah, that'd be cool. I mean, there's a lot of myth, but I'll definitely. I think there's a. I, I'm sure we could get a top five. That yeah, would be fun that would to be attack. great. That'd yeah. be cool. Like one of you every week or something, like a series, yeah. basically. Yeah, yeah. That'd, That'd be, be cool. cool. That'd Our be own really kind cool. of Mythbusters, you know? Yeah. But, but um, were you and your brother this entrepreneurial growing up? Like, did you know this kind of, you know, life and this kind of, uh, you know, business yeah. world you'd be in? Is that, were you entrepreneurial growing up? Um, I, I would say so, yes. Um, I, I think my brother was definitely like, he's a, he's a software developer. He was always just like fixing problems. Our dad actually had his own business. He had a, he ran a photocopier dealership, um, you know, and, and so we, we all worked there at some point and kind of, we have another brother as well. Uh, and, and we all, we all worked at that, that same company. It's actually, it comes up occasionally in the book. Um, but, uh, it's, I, I, I think so. But one thing I want to be careful with is, you know, I do think that entrepreneurs generally are made. I, I, I think that we can bias towards, there are people who are more biased to it just naturally, but anyone can be an entrepreneur. You can actually do this. If you, you know, if you think about it the right way, you attack it systematically, like you can be an entrepreneur. And I, I have people I talk to like, oh, that's just not me. And it's like, ah, it could be. Like it really could. You can do, you can develop this. This is something that, you know, Oprah didn't start as Oprah. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like you can get there. And, uh, I want people to believe that they can. So. Where can we follow your podcast, by the way? Yeah, well, so anywhere you get your podcast, you'll find us. Just search Startup Different. Uh, is our website, startupdifferent.com. And uh, yeah, you can follow us. Obviously, please leave comments. Uh, we're biggest on YouTube, actually. We have a pretty good uh, YouTube series going nice. as well. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, you just hit on something about anybody could do this. And I just think of those who might have these entrepreneurial efforts as a side gig. How do you turn the side gig? into your full-time life? Oh, that's an awesome question. Uh, it's hard um, and it's scary. So uh, I would say one brick at a time. Uh, don't obsess over making a crazy amount of progress in like a six month period. Like give yourself time. Uh, we, I side hustled uh, App Armor for about three years. Okay, so like it takes time for the market to develop and get there. Then this is the scary day when you tell your boss you're quitting. And when that day happens, uh, you know, you hold your breath, plug your nose and hope for the best. But, you know, good entrepreneurs take calculated big risks. 
These are not just, it's not reckless. Don't do it if you only got like 20 grand in revenue for your company. Make sure you're in a way where you can support your lifestyle and support your family to maybe it's not perfect, but pretty close to what you're doing at that company job and then uh, make the jump. So you mentioned the pandemic and of course this week is 9-11. So tragedy mm -hmm. does happen yeah. often in our world. How do entrepreneurs like yourselves navigate through tragedy? You mentioned that you were dealing with this through the pandemic as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think this kind of ties back to the importance of uh, obviously a strong support network. I know for a lot of founders, I'll tell you one thing that's really important is having a co-founder. And that kind of sounds interesting to some people because most people are like, I can do it myself and whatever, but there are so many both tangible and intangible benefits of having a co-founder. So for me, my co-founder happened to be my brother too, which was great. But you know, he basically acted as like chief psychology officer for me and and me for him, you know, I like it. We had times when we worked together and it, we really needed each other. Like we really did the highs and lows of, I mean, again, with the podcast, you know, there's highs and lows uh, and managing those peaks and valleys with someone else is really, really important. If you're a solo founder, make sure that you have a support network, whether that's your family or a mentor or whatever. But, you know, uh, sometimes and particularly as men, we like to like hold some of that in, like, oh, I'm going to push through whatever. Dude, you need to talk it out because it'll actually make you better at whatever you're trying to do business wise. Uh, and also, and you'll life wise just be, too. And life wise. Yeah. You'll be less crazy. <laughs> well, one, one of the things, because we're talking about this security on these campuses, um, I'm just thinking, are you guys consultants still for different campuses? Are you still in the consulting? <laughs> um, well, actually, because of the sale, uh, we have a little bit of a period where we can't really do anything in public oh. safety. And that's pretty standard. Usually you're not allowed to participate in the same market for a little while. Um, so that's fine. I also, um, you know, what I would be a real expert in is consulting on technology for those groups, not as much like the the actual public safety element. But yeah, well, then you can you can answer this because I'm gonna have someone else on this as well, sure. who's also in the tech space. But I want your thoughts on it. Sure. The mayor of New York's trying to get Mayor Adams trying to get through this cell phone ban in the high schools, but it's not really going. What are there pros and cons to that cell phone ban, or have you been yeah. following that kind of story? Totally. So I, I have kids, and you know I'm I'm thinking about this too, and. Uh, all the time. <laughs> uh, so on the one hand, I think that there's a lot of data that phones in classrooms is bad for children's learning and uh, it's distractions. It's all kinds of different problems. And it's even like, even if your kid doesn't have a phone, if another kid has a phone, everybody gets like sucked into it. And so I think that there's a lot going there. Now, conversely, yeah, you're right. There's a public safety angle here that does come up sometimes. I read a, a piece in the New York Times about this just the other day. And the, the, the piece there is that, yeah, if there's an emergency, if there's an active event, like kind of you mentioned, or maybe even just a bomb threat, it would just be like less intense for a second, even though it's still pretty intense. Um, like you, you need the phone because you need the message. You need what's called a mass notification. And that's also what we did a lot of in our business. So I'm of two minds. I think if we're talking about educational benefit, Definitely no phones, but maybe somebody has to have a phone in that room. Maybe the teacher does. Considering and, in just last week, this Georgia shooting, I believe yeah. kids were texting their parents, hey, this is what's going on. Yeah. And this so, is the you other know, thing parents want to know, right? Like, like, you imagine, like, you would want to know, is your kid okay? Like, my God. So there's this other angle too, like parents need, really need to be in the know when something like this happens. And when something like this comes down from the mayor's office, parents mm -hmm. should have a say in this as well, shouldn't they? Oh, of course. I mean, like, uh, I don't think you're going to get too far, like, you know, dictating solutions. I think broadly speaking, we're looking for collaboration and input and expert analysis. I think, um, nevertheless, though, this is a tremendously difficult decision for lots of different reasons. Um, you know, there's all these other, there's actually other public safety issues, right? To even having the smartphone and being on social media, like social media is objectively, you know, bad for teens' mental health. It's like there's a lot of data that's, that's starting to come up about this. And it becomes one of these complicated situations where you're like, man, there are benefits on both sides and there are drawbacks on both sides. How, what is the correct solution here? I don't think it's unreasonable for kids to not, I don't think they should have phones in the classroom. Maybe they should, have, they could have phones at school. Maybe the teacher's got in a their phone. their lockers, maybe. In their locker. Sure. Something. Yeah. Talk. You mentioned empathetic leadership in, in actually one of your topics here. So um, empathetic leadership, I'd say that kind of ties in, in with the cell phone ban. Maybe it doesn't look as empathetic toward parenting and whatnot. But from your angle in the business world, how important is empathy 
Uh, and and did empathy help you launch and grow app yeah. armor? Yeah, so I wasn't good at this at first. And so this is why it's kind of a big lesson for me. I think you go to business school and they teach you, you want to be like an alpha and whatever that is, and you're banging your chest and you're, you're like a gorilla in the market and kind of a bully basically. And I think uh, what we found worked a lot better was when we just actually took time to like invest in people. And I don't mean money. I mean like emotionally invest and understand our people and work with them and, and try to be collaborative and how we solve problems as a team and uh, how we tackled even internal issues. And to be honest, it worked a hell of a lot better. Um, I, I think after we got to a certain level of staff, I want to say like six or seven people, which is pretty small, but early, that that's really, the, the, it, things only got better. Um, our customer service got way better because they were more empathetic with the customers they were going. Our sales team got better because they were more interested in understanding the customer and working with them and collaborating with them. You know, our implementation team, everybody got better. All the software developers got better. Everybody uh, delivered. And there's actually data on this that the more empathetic you are as a leader, the more you understand people, the more you invest in them, the more you support them, the more likely those people are to be successful in their jobs. Well, there you go. Uh, thank you so much, David Singenson, and hopefully get your brother on at some point too. We'd love to talk with him as well. That'd be yeah. great. He's the chief nerd, nerd officer, so I'm sure he'd have some good tech things to to drop for you. So. That would be fun. But David, thanks for your time today on the One Leg Up Network. Thank you so much, Alex. I really appreciate being here.